As she walked away, Rufus knew, unutterably, that something wonderful had forever slipped away. She was, as all of us are, a mass of contradictions, warm yet cold, tough yet gentle, mysterious yet profoundly simple. For 33 weeks, they had danced their unpredictable dance, now hostile, now delightful, always thrilling. And nowhere was the relationship more volatile than in the sexual arena. In bed, she was both timid and bold, surprisingly aggressive about ensuring her own satisfaction. Lucas, that's not fair. A daughter of privilege, education, and fine breeding, Annabelle Farrar enjoyed nothing more than watching Rufus Wilde step in dog shit. And as she walked out of his life forever, Rufus knew only that he would never claim to understand women. Least of all, the curious specimen who in the autumn of 1999 had seemed to hold the potential to be the one. November 17th, 1999. Hey Rufus, drop by on my way home from Andrews, but you're still working. Call me when you get home if you want. Love, Annabelle. A gun! You held a gun! I mean, you had the power to kill me, but yet you chose not to use it. Yeah. Hey, you know this one? Don't be afraid, it only lasts a minute. Maybe two or three. Okay. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Will you be mobile? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm fine. Hey, where's Danny? I know this word. You are a schmuck. <laughs> oh, you're so fucking funny, you little faggot. What? I'm trying to read. Do you mind? What's your problem, you little loser? I'm not the one with the problem, pervert. Oh. Okay. Let me tell you something, cuz. When you get a little older, you'll realize the whole world revolves around sex. I mean, it's just on everyone's mind about 99.99% .99 of the day. And what's the other point, oh, one? Strangling yourself? You're gonna wind up so celibate. You're gonna wind up beeping off all day like old men in porno theaters. You're ruining my night, you know that. Good, you're ruining my millennium. Well, fuck you, little dickhead. You're on your own. This is a very busy night for you. Well, let's take a moment for you. <laughs> I hope I haven't over-rehearsed this. God forbid anything be dull. Yeah, well, then, tomorrow or, or maybe Monday, I'm not sure whether these people actually work on New Year's. I can't be certain I've wrestled with this problem for years. Pop, millennium approaches. Right. Anyway, tomorrow or Monday. But not Sunday. Uh, an attorney from the firm of Lipsky, Manos, and Strauss is going to come to your house. He's, he's got a sealed letter for you. <laughs> Dad, are you a spy? Are we all moving to Argentina to live off bugs and water? Andrew, the letter is from your mother. What? She wrote it about two weeks before the end. Oh my God. 
and she stipulated that it be delivered to you on January 1st, 2000. Dear Andrew, I'm dead. Andrew. How are you? Wish you were here? It's not that kind of letter. What kind is it? To tell you the truth, she assumed I would tell you what was in the letter. Well, did you read it? Actually, I helped her write it. Her strength was almost gone. She assumed, what well, we both assumed that in the intervening 17 and a half years, I'd find a way. The January 1st thing was just an insurance policy. Be thankful it's not a library book. I can't tell you how many times it's been on the tip of my tongue. I'm gay. What? No, I just thought that maybe the letter would clarify my sexual identity. Oh, I don't know about that. You promised me when I was five that I was not adopted. You're not. So? A couple of years after your mother died, you and I were walking up Fifth Avenue, just the two of us, and you asked me for money to buy a hot dog. I gave you a dollar, you crossed the street and dealt with the Sabret man outside the museum. And as you were coming back, carrying this hot dog all spilling over with sauerkraut, I looked at this little human being eating and communicating and paying for things, my son, out there in the world. I can't tell you how often I think about you with that hot dog. Dad, what does the letter say? I'm not your biological father. Why didn't you tell me? Well, when wouldn't have been a bad time? You were always so busy. After Mom died, I just couldn't hit you with it. I talked to people. Who? Oh, psychiatrists, a lady at Columbia, Liesel. Liesel, really? Did you take out an ad? Oh, no, Andrew. Everyone agreed. Except for me. It wasn't important for you to know, and there wasn't any harm in you not knowing. No, I mean, I'm glad that you all had a good laugh about it. I decided I'd tell you when you were 16, but we all went to a Yankee game, and it was drizzly and horrible. I thought, oh, well, 18. What happened to 17? This just wasn't a good time. Then before I knew it, you'd graduated from college. Hey, what's going on? I'm pretending to get cigarettes. Oh, Suki. I'd like you to meet Harold Goldman. He was a good friend of my mother's. What? He's not my father. What? Andrew, I'm prepared to answer any of your questions. <laughs> prepared to answer questions. Did you bring her attorney? If you'd rather wait for the letter. What letter? Oh, the letter that my mother wrote to me from death's door explaining who my real father is, that this man here has been too busy for the last 17 and a half years to deliver. Oh, that letter. Aren't you curious? I don't know, Soki, what do you think? It's the early 70s, dad's away a lot. Mark Spitz, HR Puffin stuff. I assume it's someone of an extremely sensitive nature, which would explain a few things. Son. I'm sorry. Are you talking? Do you actually have sons in the area? You have every right to be upset. Don't be so. I am not in the least upset. This is the culmination of a lifelong dream. You're not my father. Never were. Never will be. Oh, joy and rejoice. I'm an orphan. He's sad, can I have some more? Andrew. Look, Suki needs your cigarettes. You're dripping wet. Let us return to the party with this wonderful news with which to ring in the new year. Are you coming, Suki? 
Harold. <laughs>